All right, well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to this ITIF event on uh, in, uh, competition policy, and in particular as it applies to innovation-based industries. Uh, I could not ask for a more distinguished panel of uh, scholars here to join me today. Uh, I'll introduce them. I'll make some opening remarks. Uh, we'll hear from each of them. We'll have some time for discussion, including with you, and we will adjourn uh, precisely uh, at 1130. Uh, on my immediate uh, left is Carl Shapiro. Carl is the Transamerica Professor of Business Strategy at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley. He also was a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors from 2011 to 2012. Prior to that, he was Deputy Assistant uh, Attorney General uh, for Economics in the Antitrust Division at DOJ. Uh, he's also been at Berkeley for since 98. Uh, and he earned his PhD from MIT in 1981 and also taught at Princeton. Howard Schlansky is a professor of law at Georgetown, uh, also a partner in Davis's, Davis Polk's litigation department. Uh, he uh, previously served as administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, OIRA, from 2013 to 2017. Prior to that, he was director of the FTC's Bureau of Economics. Uh, he was also a uh, chief economist at the FCC from 1999 to 2000 and a senior economist at the President's Council of Economic Advisors in the Clinton administration and was a professor of law at UC Berkeley where he directed the Center for Law and Technology. Uh, and on my far left is John Yun. Uh, John is uh, the director of economic education at the Global Antitrust Institute. Uh, prior to that, he was acting Deputy Assistant Director in the Bureau of Economics Antitrust Division at the FTC. Uh, he had an over 18-year career at the FTC, including uh, looking at a wide variety of issues, including horizontal mergers, vertical restraints, and exclusionary conduct. And he holds a PhD in economics from Emory. So why are we having this event uh, today? Uh, we're having this event because in our view, uh, ITIF's view, there's been a revival of, if you will, neo-Brandeisian thinking in the politics of the United States today. For those of you who don't remember your history, Louis Brandeis was a famous uh, uh, advocate uh, from Massachusetts, or worked in Massachusetts from Kentucky, uh, appointed to the Supreme Court by Wilson and was really one of the leading intellectual voices against the rise of concentration uh, and really industrialization uh, in the United States. Brandeis was really a defender of sort of small farms, small businesses, the bucolic sort of Jeffersonian vision of the United States. Um, and uh, his vision abs 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 obviously failed. Uh, he was fighting a rear guard action against change that was just inevitable. We were going to become an industrialized country with big corporations. Uh, today, uh, that vision has been resurrected. Uh, you see people like Senator Elizabeth Warren say, uh, quote, in America, competition is dying. Consolidation and con concentration are, in the, are on the rise. Uh, Barry Lynn and Phil Longman at New America Right, the degree of consolidation in many industries today bears a striking resemblance to that of the Gilded Age. Uh, Nell Abernathy, uh, the Roosevelt Institute, applies this thinking to the tech sector, and she writes, perhaps most alarming is the tech sector, where a combination of network effects, outdated laws, and permissive regulation have enabled a handful of company, companies to consolidate vast control. Now, with the exception of perhaps that statement, the prior statements are simply wrong. Uh, there really has been, been at best a modest increase in consolidation, uh, but really nothing that I would argue, we would argue, is alarming. So this notion that sort of consolidation is rampant and if in sort of economics terms, if you think about this, there's what's called the C4 ratio, where the top four firms in any industry have, uh, it's the ratio of how much they share, uh, those numbers are not historically high for most industries today in America. The problem with, I think, the way this debate is shaped is that the uh, neo-Brandeisians have this view of the world that bigness is only achieved through unfair means. Uh, Brandeis himself believed that, where he argued that the only reason large firms could get big was that they did something nefarious. 
Uh, it's Tom McGraw, uh, a scholar, historian, prominent historian who studied Brandeis, says, uh, by his frequent references to the curse of bigness, he meant that bigness itself was the mark of Cain, a mark of prior sinning. So when you look at a lot of the discussion today about size, you see it all in the sense of size and concentration are negative, uh, and they're achieved only or largely by nefarious means. You also now increasingly have neo-Brandeisians just reject what is sort of fundamental that you learn in week one of industrial economics, which is economies of scale. Uh, Matt Stoller, who was at New America, um, working with Barry Lynn, he said, I'm increasingly convinced that the biggest con in business history is the notion of economies of scale. So all three of our scholars here are con men because they've all argued that there are, there are economies of scale as virtually every single economist who studies industrial organization acknowledges there are economies of scale. Yeah, by some originalist, <laughs> So actually, uh, the originalist probably was the Boston Consulting Group who wrote uh, a famous book, Perspectives on Experience, back in the 60s, where they argue that more experience, in other words, more output by a firm reduces cost uh, because, of experience, because of knowledge and experience. Um, the Obama Council of Economic Advisors, this may have been Carl's uh, language, but I wrote, the benefit, wrote in an issue brief that um, uh, scale efficiencies are one possible increase, one possible reason for an increase in concentration. In other words, companies are getting more efficient, and that's a good thing. Uh, the BLS recently had a study that said uh, mergers have been found are found to have a positive impact on total factor productivity growth, accounting for 0.36 percentage points of TFP growth in the 2000s. So there's clearly something beneficial that we should at least acknowledge. That's not to say that. You want firms, industries with a C4 ratio of 100, uh, nor that, is it to say that large firms can't use or abuse power in ways they shouldn't. But it's very different than the current argument. One of the reasons I think we have this discussion is that competition policy is not a science, uh, nor is economics. And so you have sort of schools of thought, if you will. Uh, I won't go into a lot of details. This is a report that I think is back there. but. Um, you have essentially what uh, you could argue are four schools of thought. Populist would be kind of a Brandeisian view, which is really about democracy and fairness for consumers. You have the Chicago School, which is really fundamentally about consumer welfare and allocation. You have post-Chicago, which would be people who are you know, fundamentally in that realm but are a little more focused on, on fairness, perhaps. And then you have what I would call the Carl and Howard School, uh, or actually one time I used to call it the Berkeley School, uh, which is really kind of thinking more strategically about innovation uh, in an antitrust sense and dynamic effects. Chicago can be criticized, I think, for focusing only on, or largely on short-term allocation. And I think we need to be thinking about competition policy in both short-term and a long-term perspective. So for today's focus, I think the really key thing to understand is that a lot of the neo-Brandeisians are bringing to the debate a view of the world that maybe makes sense for uh, the dry cleaning industry or the haircut industry or industries where there really are very few economies of scale or network effects or really innovation. Uh, but that's very different than innovation industries. Uh, and I think we have to understand that. That's, there's a lot of fundamental difference between uh, innovation industries and sort of normal or non-innovation industries. And I would argue uh, there are really two kinds of innovation industries. One are, if you will, is a little bit of a simplification, but R&D intensive industries. Uh, and the other are network-based industries. So you look at a company like Boeing. Uh, Boeing is a, uh, is a company that has to spend a lot of R&D to be able to produce a product. You look at a company like Facebook, they do R&D, but the real advantage for Facebook is it's a network uh, industry where the more users means more value for both sides of the equation. So how do we think about R&D industries. Well, one is Im the importance there is recognize that while these companies that have market share may look invulnerable, in innovation-based industries, there's a notion of what, the Schumper of what uh, some call Schumpeterian competition after the term Joseph, what Joseph Schumpeter term. And a good article by that is by Joe Farrell and Michael Katz, who write, in network markets subject to technological progress, 
Competition may take the form of a succession of temporary monopolists who displace one another through innovation. Such competition is called Schumpeterian rivalry. In other words, the risk to some of these companies is not at the margin. It's by somebody coming up with something brand new. A good case in point there, I have, I have the uh, picture of ice. What's that all about? A famous uh, Supreme Court case in 1932 called New State Ice versus Liebman. And that was a case in Oklahoma where the state of Oklahoma passed a law that regulated ice companies. These were guys that would out, go in the middle of the winter. They'd cut big blocks of ice. They'd store them in cold places. And then in the summertime, they'd come around and deliver ice to your house. Uh, and they uh, regulated them as a public utility. Uh, this was a few years, just a few years before the mass consumption of ice makers or refrigerators. So all these companies went out of business in 10 years. Uh, and so it was a case where they, the regulators, in this case, didn't conceive of Schumpeterian competition. The second part here, I think that's important to understand, in innovation industries. And Carl, I hope you referenced your excellent paper you just wrote, I don't know, a year or so ago maybe on that or a couple of years ago. Uh, and there's a debate in the economics field around this, uh, which is how much competition is optimal in an industry for innovation. And then you have sort of, maybe uh, Carl didn't say there are two sides, but it seems like two sides here. One, one is uh, Kenneth Arrow's view, which is generally on the more competition side is better, and the other is on the Schumpeter side, which was that you want some levels of concentration in innovation-based industries because they're taking huge risks uh, in reinvesting back in R&D. And they need to be able to spend a lot of money on R&D and take these risks. And if you have sort of super competition with, non, with normal profits, you just don't have any incentive or ability to do R&D. Um, this is a good, uh, good uh, uh, William Baumel, the famous innovation economist who recently passed away, writes, in markets with too much, without too much difficulty of entry, an increase in concentration may not be ascribable by attempts of firms to achieve monopoly power, but rather to innovation and the resulting technological changes that make it efficient for output to be provided by firms that are larger. So um, the other, uh, and there's a sort of very, uh, de I guess, highly debated point in industrial economics around the inverted U. So the notion of an inverted U when it comes to concentration and innovation is that there's a sweet spot. If you have too much concentration, you, you have enough, you have, you have monopoly profits, but you have no incentive to innovate. If you're too far over on the other side, too much competition, you have incentives to compete, but not the revenues to fund it. I think there's a good good evidence that that inverted U is real, and it's kind of like the Laffer curve. You can argue where on the Laffer curve you start to tilt either way, but I think it's real and it needs to be taken seriously. Good study recently by Parama Sanal and Linda Cohen found that electric utility R&D declined by 79% after U.S. electricity markets were restructured to make them more competitive. So we got the benefits of competition in electric utilities in the sense of lower prices, but at the cost of reduced R&D and future innovation. Okay. So the second set of industries really are what you call network-based industries, where the more users you have in an industry, the more valuable the industry becomes. The example, a case in point, is social media, social networks. Um, there was a reason why only one firm won there. Uh, how many people here have, when you have a picture that you want to post on Facebook, how many people would really enjoy the government breaking up Facebook into Facebook and Headbook, and now half of your friends are on Headbook, or maybe they're all on Headbook and they're all on Facebook, and you now have to post into who different places? Of course you wouldn't want to do that. There's a reason why there's one Twitter. There's a reason why there's one Facebook. There's a reason why there's one LinkedIn. Uh, these industries have network uh, scale effects, and uh, it means they're going to end up being big. The Obama Council of Economic Advisors report, again, maybe Carl wrote this, uh, said, quote, some newer technology markets are characterized by network effects with large positive spillovers from having many consumers use the same products. Markets in which network effects are important, such as social media companies, uh, social media sites may become dominated by one firm. Uh, I would point out the key point here, large positive spillovers. That's what we have to remember. 
And the last point on this is in these industries, we have to remember the relevant market for competition is not the social network industry. It's not the search market. It's the ad market. So when, the, when we're talking about free service industries, which give their services away for free, the market that we have to be thinking about is there competition in the ad market. Do these companies have unfair uh, market power to enable them to get super normal ad revenues? And I think the answer to that is no. But that's still an empirical, that's where the empirical antitrust investigation question should be, not on the actual product side. So I think just to close, what is the role of competition authorities? Um, number one, recognize that innovation industries are different. And we should have a goal in our view in society to maximize innovation for the welfare of the economy and consumers. Uh, to the extent we need to take action, it shouldn't be based on sort of this 1950s structure conduct performance pa not paradigm where you look at very low levels of concentration with fear and loathing, but rather that we look at, perform we look at conduct. And it's not to say there, there are cases of conduct by large firms in the tech industry which have been investigated and found problematic. That's where, in our view, competition policy should look at. And finally, uh, we need to recognize global factors. In a lot of these industries, U.S. firms are competing with global giants, many of them funded by their domestic uh, governments, particularly in China. Uh, and the sort of risk, I, the sort of, uh, I think the risk of going down a, a sort of heavy neo-Brandeisian path is it will whittle our companies down to size, and then they will just simply be decimated by larger and well, more well-funded and more innovative foreign competitors. Uh, so if you want more of that, and, and you can wait until uh, April, which is how a academic publishers on the timeline they're on. This is a book that my colleague Mike Lind at New America and I have written called Big is Beautiful, Debunking the Myth of Small Business, which will be released by MIT Press in April. Uh, and it goes into much more detail on that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carl. Morning. Uh, good. We get to my stuff. There we go. Excellent. Good morning. So thank you, Rob, for inviting me. It's great to be here. Uh, like Rob um, and probably others on the panel, for about the last two years, I've been as somebody who's done worked in antitrust for many years, really been noticing this drumbeat of wow, we have a real problem with competition in the United States. We have all these monopolies, concentration which was kind of news to me. So um, I was, you know, like, am I missing something? Or, you know, what's causing this? What's going on? So, so I've been watching that pretty closely. I have a paper, Antitrust in a Time of Populism, that I just uh, posted. And uh, some copies are available on the back. And so my uh, version today is high-tech antitrust in a time of populism, which is, you know, part of that. So let me just first go through some slides that have come, come, uh, just more for fun and set things up. This is not a new uh, thing. This is a this is a cartoon. The bosses of the Senate from right around the time of the Sherman Act, 1890. A lot of concern about uh, really the, the the first big populist era of populism in the United States, and it was really political concern about the power of large corporations, which I happen to be concerned about today myself. Okay, but I'm here to talk about economic power today. Um, the um, you know here's Standard Oil, um, you know. Gobbling things up, and at first, one of the, the really probably the very first really big Sherman Act case around 1911 was the Standard Oil case. It was broken up. Right now, we can spin the clock ahead. Uh, today's uh, octopus-like um, uh, imagery is Amazon here. Um, but what's interesting, even if you look at these cards, this is from the Economist. You see, the top one is serving the consumer. Right, that's like bringing everything to you on a platter. But of course, the competitors are all tied up. So you know, that's the dynamic. I mean, that's, that, you know, if you had to put in a cartoon, uh, Amazon, and, you know, enormous growth. Okay, so that's, that's one company, obviously, of the large tech companies that The Economist uh, featured. Uh, uh, and and this, they, they, this is also The Economist, you know, this consolidation, high profits, the little one, the little, okay, so, so we're getting this imagery. That's going to be our book coverage. <laughs> you like that one, okay. Uh, where am I in this? I'm on one of the little figures there below. Uh, Okay, New York Times, uh, competition doesn't exist anymore in a lot of markets. It's relating this to inequality. Um, again, I mean, look, look at that language from The Economist. You know, they're not exactly a communist organization, right? I mean, 
the rise of a corporate class that threatens both competition and the legitimacy of business. I'm like, whoa, you know, like this is serious. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, uh, again, the imagery of the superstar is more of the tech sector. Um, this is about a year ago now from The Economist. Um, and the notion that it's very hard for small firms to make it, okay, because the big ones are, are blocking their entry. So, uh, all right. So I said, look, look. Let, let's take a little closer look at the data everybody's looking at. Let's let's we'll take a deep breath and look at the evidence. And and at least from my experience with antitrust, what what do we really make of that? And I, frankly, I was coming at this from the perspective, you know, am I missing something? Are we missing something? You know, have we? Should, do we need to to kind of step up the game here? Okay. Or is this just something else going on in the press? So The Economist has a very nice uh, feature, feature, this is about a year ago, um, I can't remember now exactly, where they, where they, you can go on their site and they've looked, basically the economic census is the source almost everybody uses for concentration, because they report uh, concentration measures in four digit industries, okay, a certain level of aggregation. And I gave some examples, there's about uh, 800, 893 The Economist reports on, you can cut it up a little differently if you go back to the original data. But these are things like health insurance, motor vehicles, pharmaceuticals. Now, something like that, wait, pharmaceuticals, that's not really a market. That's a sector. Okay, there's a lot of different markets within that. So we know this isn't going to line up very well in a lot of cases with how competition actually takes place or what antitrust people would call relevant markets. But it's, a lot, it's, but it's, it's what we've got in the data across the economy. Okay, and they, so they compare what's happened to concentration. Uh, the economic census is only done every five years, so they've, they've compared... 97 in 2012, okay. Um, and uh, the, the diagram here, it's a little hard to read, but the horizontal axis would be the four firm concentration ratio in 1997, and then the vertical axis is the four firm concentration ratio in 2012. So if stuff is above the 45 degree line, it means there's been an increase in concentration, okay. And the colors are the sectors, and the size of the circle is the uh, commerce in that sector, okay, the big circles being more, okay. So you can see that there's, there is some drift up. There's more circles above the line than below. But a lot of this, if you look at it, the, 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 maybe you not be able to read, but the four from concentration ratios, you know, almost all these sectors are below 50. Okay, so just take that. The top four firms may have 40 or 50%. It, it all varies. A lot of them are 30%. So what's that? Think about a, a market. Again, these are too big to be markets where you had a four from concentration ratio of, say, 40%, you might have, let's say, well, you could have four 10% firms, say the top four firms, that would do it. Or maybe you have 15, 15, 5, 5, okay? Those are not markets that antitrust people would think are certainly not monopolized. You could call it an oligopoly, but it's not a very tight oligopoly because there's still 60% of the market served by other firms, okay? So there's been some drift up, but at least to antitrust economists, we go like, we kind of be a shrug. Okay. So this is being reported, but when you actually look at the numbers, like there's not really that much there. They summarize this by sector. This is the same data. And uh, actually information, IT, telecoms, and media are the highest here. But what is the highest? It, the four firm concentration ratio on average across markets in that sector went up from 40 to 46% or something. Okay. So again, it's in that range where it's, there's some modest increases in concentration. But I would not view it as alarming, okay? And by at least the normal standards of antitrust, these would not be particularly concentrated markets. Now, this, this, will, this average will mask some, some variation across the individual markets, but, we're, but these, the press and the people are talking about generalized, systematic increases in concentration. I'm happy to stipulate there are a bunch of markets that have become more concentrated, and some are worrisome to me, okay? There have been hospital mergers that I wish hadn't gone through, okay? There's been uh, issues in the airline industry. But we're talking, is there a systematic shift here? And the data is really not showing that in a way that, that I would think is, uh, amounts to much. Um, I sliced out just for today the uh, information technology. So again, a lot of these uh, mar sector uh, groupings, markets within IT are not particularly concentrated. The one that stands out is wireless carriers, actually. So that would be one to look at. Okay, the, 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 the four firm concentration ratio went up from roughly 50% to close to 90%. Okay, you know the four firms, right? At least there's four for now. Okay, but that's also an example. I'm pretty sure a lot of what happened was regional consolidation. We had regional carriers, 
and then they consolidate into national carriers because this is this is over the whole United States. So this also will will give you incorrect measures if you've got local markets and then firms become national that look more concentrated nationally when the local markets might not have changed. Um, so now I'm not say, saying that maybe that sector is, maybe that particular market is worrisome. I'm not going to say one way or another, but that stands out. The other ones, not so much. Okay. Uh, okay, so concentration, there's not that much there in the data at a high level. Profits is the other thing that people have been pointing to, very high profits. So I thought, let's look, let's look a little more closely there. Okay. Um, uh, here's the economist again. Profits are too high. America needs a giant dose of competition. Okay. I love that image, by the way. I just want to be the guy standing on the top. <laughs> uh, so I went and looked at the data, okay, which most of these people I don't, I don't know, bother to do. Um, so this is corporate profits as a fraction of GDP right out of the national income accounts. Okay? So there are some measurement issues, as always. But this is what gets reported, uh, 85 to 2016. So I would say there's a significant increase in reported corporate profits. If you look at the average over the first 10-year period here, it's around 7 to 8% of GDP. And the last 15 years, you got a dip in the Great Recession, to be sure. But it's generally been in the 11 12% range. 10, 11, 12 percent range. That's a 50 percent increase, right? From 7 to 8 percent up to 10 to 11 percent, or 11 to 12 percent. So there is, I think, a significant increase in corporate profits. That's interesting. I'm wondering what's going on with that. Oops. Um, sorry. What happened? I somehow jumped ahead. Don't look. You're not supposed to see this. What the heck? How did I even do that with this? this is, Almost back. I'm trying. Okay. I, I, we're good. We're good. Um, okay. So let's look by sector. Okay. Again, 98 to 2016. See, I'm like, where is this big increase in profits happening? Okay. Again, same data, um, but broken out by industry. And this is worth, worth taking a moment to look at. So, um, Take the big ones. Manufacturing was, again, this is share of all the corporate domestic profits by sector. Okay, so the overall went up, it went up from, let's say, 7 or 8% of GDP to 11 to 12, but what's the distribution? So manufacturing definitely went down from about 30% to 22%. That's not surprising because the manufacturing sector has generally declined and, of course, faced a lot of competition from imports. Okay, the thing that, the, the one that's really gone up a lot is finance and insurance. Okay. which I think is something to think about. I don't know whether it's a competition issue, but there's a lot of money being made in that sector, and one would naturally wonder, you know, is, this, is the contribution to our economy um, commensurate with the profits that are being earned? Okay. Um, I have some issues about that. Uh, but looking, anyhow, you could look more generally. Um, I'll just flag information here, going up from 5.3% to 7.8%. And I, I, just so we know it's, uh, what is information, I put the, the subcategories there at the bottom, publishing, software, motion pictures, sound recordings. does include information and data processing services, telecom. So, so that's what a lot of what we're thinking about, about high tech, would be in there. Um, you know, uh, probably, you know, I presume Boeing's not in there. You know, these boundaries are always a little bit tricky these days. But uh, so that's... Um, not a huge increase, but you know, five, from, from 5.3 to 7.8. So I think this is helpful, but again, it doesn't really tell me why the profits are going up high, except suggesting you know, something in the, in the finance sector to me. Okay, so the, so look at it. So the concentration stuff, I, I, it's kind of not that much there. The profits, I think there's really something here in the data. So there are questions. I don't have answers. I have maybe hypotheses. Yes, why did corporate profits grow so high, so much? Are they persistent at the firm and industry levels? I'm not really sure. There's some mixed evidence about that. I'd like people to look at it. And then have entry and expansion become less effective at eliminating the rents to incumbents? Okay. And this is part of the drumbeat of the people who are most concerned about large companies and the profits is, is they can't be challenged anymore, you know, as opposed to the position Rob just articulated, which is, is when technology is changing, the challenges are often uh, coming, even if you don't see them. Okay. These, I think, are the big questions. Um, 
I tend to think there, in, the other thing in the tech sector, you could not just look at the profits, but of course look at market capitalization, which are through the roof. Partly that's just low interest rates, which we would increase all the asset values. But it's also, I think, a, a recognition that it is harder to challenge some of these big companies. Okay? So I think there are some significant entry barriers. Um, and I'll come back to that. Okay. Oh, now I did it again somehow. Uh, okay, I think I'm there. Okay, so, so what does this tell us? Now in terms of policy implications, and I'll just zip through this, and this is what we're gonna talk about, I think, uh, next up. So the, the one interpretation, the one that's been out there by the neo-Brandsians, Brandeisians, would be there's a widespread decline in competition because of consolidation, bar entry bearers, exclusionary conduct. This is contributing to productivity, growth, and inequality, okay? Now, the trouble with that is the, con the concentration isn't, hasn't gone up that much. I'm looking for people to tell me what the exclusionary conduct was, exactly. And, um, you know, I don't know, this link to productivity growth seems a little bit um, not established, okay, in terms of um, the, the data, okay? Um, contrary interpretation, or much more along the lines we have Rob, is look, there's growing economies of scale. So a lot of these sectors, we would expect larger firms to gain some share, okay? Um, and that's, look, there are enormous scale economies in the tech sector. Let's not kid around. I mean, you've got enormous R&D before you even get to the network effects. A lot of first copy costs with software. It's subject to substantial economies of scale. Um, so that's not a surprise. We've known that for a long time. Um, Geographic consolidation is also, like I said, often can be efficient, and we've seen that in a lot of sectors. I think it's a social issue. You know, if there are fewer locally owned restaurants or you know, office supply stores and we've got all these chains, it's not a competition problem. You know, when Walmart comes into town, it may be an issue with labor. It may be an issue with the social fabric of the local economy in a small town, but it's not a competition issue. Okay, unless Walmart's doing something nefarious, which I haven't heard about regarding you know, the competition side. And of course, you've got globalization as well, which, um, which even in increases the scale economies because there are global markets. Um, fixed costs can be spread out even more widely. Okay? Um, in a lot of cases in the tech sector, I think this is going to be closer to the story. I'm not going to generalize. Different markets are different. But what's striking to me is the people, many of the people who are beating the drums here, don't even seem to be aware of this contrary interpretation and certainly are not engaging in which hypothesis fits better, the data and the evidence. And that strikes me as just incomplete. Um, okay, so antitrust and innovation, um, as, as Rob said, there's, there's people, a number of people calling for fundamentally rethinking what antitrust is supposed to be about. The consumer welfare standard is the, is the consensus approach to antitrust, which is, in my words, antitrust is about protecting the competitive process so that consumers get the benefits of competition. Okay. Um, and uh, these talks about shifting away from that, I don't think nobody's presented a, a workable and attractive alternative from my point of view. Attacking large firms simply because they obtain dominant positions, that's something we learned long ago not to do and have even taught the rest of the world not to do. And uh, to depart from that would seem to me a major error. Um, now, I think today's large tech companies, are, there, many of them have substantial economic power. Uh, whether it will erode anytime soon, I don't know. It may, it may not. Uh, to me, the key thing is that the competitive process should give small firms an opportunity to dethrone the incumbent or to chip away at parts of their business. And if there's conduct that big companies engage in that harms consumers and excludes those disruptive competitors, antitrust should be right there going after it. So I think these companies warrant scrutiny, but it shouldn't just be because they're large. It's because the question should be, tell me what Facebook did or Google or Amazon, whatever it is. Tell me what they did or what they might have done that warrants investigation or action that harms consumers and excludes competitors. Okay? And unless you're willing to talk about what that conduct is, I don't know why. What, why is there an antitrust issue? Okay. Now, at the same time, antitrust cannot substitute for regulation. 
What I mean by that, there's a lot of other things going on. Maybe it has to do with uh, cybersecurity issues, privacy issues, ownership of data, um, political issues, disclosure of ads. There's a ton of stuff where the, these, these big tech companies are a really important part of our society, not just the economy. And if we want, I think there's all sorts of reasons we, want, we need new rules. Uh, but that's not about competition and antitrust. And to expect antitrust to, to, to address that is, I think, unrealistic and actually would be counterproductive. So the, the, tr the fundamental problem is we need some new rules and regulations as the world's changed. And if that's not happening, people are looking to antitrust, but it's not the right solution Okay, so for all these things. So uh, let's not forget what we've learned. Antitrust has a specific role, should not be going after big companies. And we can't ask it to do things it's not uh, designed to do. Okay, thanks. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks, Rob, for inviting me. It's great to be here. It's great to be in a room, a panel of people, all of whom I've worked with, and a room full of people, many of whom I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, so first, a disclosure. Um, I sometimes get paid money by big companies to say nice things about them in court or to an agency. Um, I also sometimes say not nice things about them. Depends what, you know, which one it is. But um, uh, I am not now being paid by any big company. So I'm here just to talk about some of the issues that have been raised on this panel. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is strongly recommend that you read Carl's paper, Antitrust in the Time of Populism, because I think it is the best statement of what I would call um, the centrist or perhaps slightly less of left of centrist view of antitrust, which when one puts uh, that view in context, context of the kind of uh, neo-Brandeisian movement, as Rob calls it, that is taking place, uh, actually starts to look like a relatively conservative position. Why does it look conservative? It looks conservative because of the points Carl just made at the end of his talk which is that we don't yet have a better idea of what antitrust should be pursuing than the consumer welfare standard that, than, uh, that it has pursued for decades. One can quibble about whether that has become too cramped and narrow. One can quibble about whether antitrust is making full use of the tools that it has. I'll come back to that in a moment. But in terms of fundamentally supplanting what the mission of antitrust is and what the goals are that antitrust should pursue, uh, Carl makes a very strong case that we're actually in a very good place with sort of the received establishment uh, and well-established views of what antitrust can do. Um, and changing them has some real hazards. So what's going on with this debate and why are we having the Neo-Brandeisian uh, debate? Uh, I do not think it is a simple idea of looking at antitrust, deciding it hasn't been strong enough in pursuing consumer welfare and achieving its goals, and suggesting we need stronger or broader antitrust uh, enforcement. Uh, I think something a lot broader is going on, and I think it is a fundamental dissatisfaction with the very limited goals of antitrust. Antitrust is something that basically pursues low prices and high output, and in its more dynamic form, uh, tries to make sure that we do not uh, stymie the flow of innovation through anti-competitive practices or mergers so that we get good products and services going forward into the future. So for that reason, antitrust will recognize economies of scale. Uh, they do exist. They don't always exist where claimed, but they do exist. It's why we have a lot of the very large firms that we have. Similarly with network effects, they do exist. They don't always exist where claimed, but they are a good reason that consumers like to have, as Rob you know, mentioned, uh, platforms that all of us use uh, because you don't want to divide your friends uh, across different phone networks, across different word processing programs, uh, across different social media. You want to be able to go to one place that service is more valuable the more people you can interact with. And I don't think that the Neo-Brandeisians necessarily deny the benefits of economies of scale or of network effects. I think what this debate is really about is collateral consequences of antitrust pursuing its goals well. When antitrust pursues its goals well, we may get large firms, but they are firms that are getting large because they're bringing something new 
and valuable to consumers at a price that consumers find worth paying. Uh, when that happens, it can be very hard for a competitor that is not doing those things as well to get into the marketplace. And you can have market leadership, you can have very large firms. So you may have people talk about the breakup of Facebook, but I think what people are really concerned about is when these large platforms go beyond the economies of scale and the network effects in the narrow range of services that brought them to power and on which they became big, and become arbiters and gateways of many other markets where those economies of scale, uh, that kind of, of network interaction has never been seen before. So think about Amazon. Amazon is becoming the merchant for literally everything. Um, so Amazon is not just another place to go shop. It's not just a place to uh, comparison shop. It's not just a place to shop if you're willing to be a little bit patient and get something in a couple of days because they'll drone it to your house. The drone will let itself in. You'll watch the drone on your smartphone letting itself in. It'll probably leave you flowers, feed the cat, and leave you far better off and you've never had to leave your office. So the concerns that I think are coming up in the neo-Brandeisian market are that the or, or argument is that the very policy weapon or policy enforcement uh, institution, antitrust, that is supposed to create consumer welfare is in some other ways bringing, making people less powerful. We're getting lower prices, but we are losing control over who we deal with we are losing control over um, the nature of the jobs that we hold because the productive efficiencies that underlie a lot of these big firms have consequences for jobs. And we are also losing economic opportunity in the sense of uh, being able to start a small business and have a chance of making your small business work without dealing with some significant gateway. You want to start a newspaper, you better make sure you're getting your news, um, you know, linked and sent around on Facebook or uh, that you're easily found on Google. You want to sell something, that's great. You got your own drones that will let themselves into people's houses and feed the cats and leave everything nice and neat? Maybe not. So maybe you have to deal with Amazon. I am not saying that these arguments are necessarily correct, but I think those are what underlie a lot of the current debate. So the debate isn't so much about antitrust not doing its job right. It's that doing that job right has collateral consequences. And antitrust, and this is where I disagree very, very strongly with the neo Brandeisians, antitrust needs to take those collateral consequences into account and think more broadly. Now, that would be a very alien kind of thing for a US antitrust agency to do. How would a U.S. antitrust agency, and would we even want them as a matter of democratic principle to balance low prices versus high wages? You've got winners and losers there. I may get really, really low prices from Walmart. There's a reason I get really low prices from Walmart. Walmart goes out into the market as an extraordinarily powerful buyer and tells people what they're going to sell at Walmart, you know, what price they're going to sell to Walmart at. And next year, that price is going to be 2.4% lower, or whatever it is. So what does that manufacturer do? That manufacturer, that producer, goes back and has to squeeze costs out of its system. Mechanization, uh, scale economies, um, substitution of capital for labor as we get more efficient kinds of automation. All of these have impacts that people might point to and say, wait a minute. So I can buy the pickles for three sixty nine dollars for a giant barrel, but I can't get a job that is stable, where I have control over my life, where I can invest because five years down the road I'll know I still have the job. Again, I'm not saying these arguments are correct, but I think these are the sentiments that are driving the current debate over antitrust. So I don't think this is about simply big is bad in the old way of thinking that big is bad. I don't think this is necessarily a denial, except by all but you know a few fringe uh, thinkers, of the existence of economies of scale. I think it's a recognition that they do exist and they have serious consequences. So the real question is, are these qu consequences real or perceived? And to the extent they are real, how do we deal with them as a society? Um, there is 
conflicting data on whether or not the uh, problems are real or perceived. And I will not get into the debate right now about real incomes and how real incomes have changed across the economic distribution. You'll have people argue that real incomes have actually meaningfully declined for, uh, for, for large sectors of the population, that even if the incomes have increased, um, the costs of living and the instability of their lives uh, of people's lives have offset those increases. You have all kinds of debates there, but I think we have to have a serious, sober debate, much like the one Carl has brought to the questions of concentration and profit increase about the income inequality degradation of work. But let's stipulate that it exists. Is antitrust the right tool to deal with, uh, with that problem? And by the way, there is, I think, reasonably strong data saying that small business creation has declined. So the economic opportunity point may be uh, a, a very salient one. Uh, my family long owned a hardware store in uh, southern New Jersey. Uh, my cousins who ran the store for generations packed it up because there was no way one could survive running a hardware store in this day and age of people ordering anything they want um, online or going to you know, large superstores. You just couldn't have that family business anymore. Um, why would you enter such a business now, a business you might have started in 1950? Small business creation, there's some interesting data there. Again, is that an antitrust problem? And I would say, suggest that most of these problems are not at all antitrust problems. Uh, antitrust should, I think, continue to pursue the objectives it has pursued. We ought to let other policy arms deal with some of the other problems about the nature of work and income inequality. A much more direct way to get at income inequality is through the tax system. Uh, it's through uh, systems of entitlements and distributional policies. Uh, much better ways at getting at wages and work is, again, through wage policy and labor policy. The overtime rule that the Obama administration tried very hard to put in place, one can argue that there was some overreach there, but the sentiment was the right one. You know, start to enforce the laws we have on the books that deal more directly with these problems, and you are more likely to solve them. First of all, you'll solve them better by more expert people. I can tell you, John Young is a great economist. Uh, had the pleasure of working with him at the FTC. I wouldn't have wanted John telling me, you know, we can get really low prices here if this if this merger takes place because they're going to get great economies of scale. Really, really worried about what it's going to do to the wages and the scheduling protocols that the companies are using, though. So I'm thinking on grounds of protecting the workers, let's screw the buyers. You know, I wouldn't want John making that decision. John wouldn't want to, want to have made that decision. And as a democratic society, I don't think we want the FTC or the head of the antitrust division weighing those things. I want them thinking about market power in terms of prices, output, and innovation. Let them do their job because it is something that pays off for a lot of people and shift the other things to other policy mechanisms. Just a quick word on those mechanisms. Regulation. Spent a lot of time over the last few years thinking about regulation. Um, Carl mentioned antitrust cannot do the job of regulation. And for 90% of regulation, that is absolutely true. Competition won't solve all problems, and you shouldn't try to be managing like coordination to solve problems by what mergers you allow or what uh, you know, coordinated activities you allow out there in the marketplace as an antitrust agency. But there's a healthy percentage of regulation that does deal with competition-oriented issues. And I think antitrust does need to be attentive to deregulation in those areas where you have competition-oriented rules and you've got agencies not enforcing them or repealing them. I think it's a good thing for the antitrust agencies to pay attention and say, okay, we used to stay out of there. The Department of Transportation dealt with that or the Department of Agriculture dealt with that. They're not dealing with it now, especially during a radical deregulatory cycle, which we are in right now or launching into right now. It's the wrong time for antitrust to step back. So I think there's a lot that antitrust can do, both in making better use of its tools, in stepping into markets where regulation is receding on the competition-oriented regulation front, um, and that I would argue, I think, as Carl and others do, that there is more we can do with antitrust, but that more should not include making antitrust the general policy balancer, uh, balancer for all of the woes of income inequality. Thanks.
or a bouncer. Hi, uh, good morning, and um, I, I find my role here today is really just to pass the ball to these guys, but um, so I'm going to keep the remarks fairly brief, but I have just sort of two broad points I want to make. One is, what's the genesis and origin of sort of this movement to maybe change the standard of antitrust away from the consumer welfare standard that we're familiar with to something different? And there's different strands of it, but generally that's the flavor of it. I think there's sort of two strands two sort of things behind it. One is this populist notion that sh which Carl and Howard both mentioned. Um, and there's assigning sort of uh, virtues to smaller businesses and vices to larger ones. And large defined not just in terms of your top of the HHI table, but you're just large in an absolute sense as well. That sort of two components of sort of big in this context. And populist has been with us for a long time. Um, this notion is, is um, a strong prior that I think uh, your con average consumer has. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but the problem is, is that having facts and dis disseminating those facts to those consumers is difficult. And things that Carl did today informs us about these issues, but it's hard to really you know, get a lot of distribution for that. So the second strand, I think, is sort of a political economy strand, though, and it's one of wider why is there a call for a change? And I think at least one component of that is, is competitors. Competitors lower on the table. Naturally, you're going to have winners and losers whenever uh, you're, you have market competition. And when you're at the top of the table, almost by definition, you're winning more than you're losing. And consequently, that creates some, um, at least, incentive to rent seek. And rent seek, it doesn't always mean a bad thing. Uh, being at the FTC for so long, often you get a lot of great information from competitors and rivals about the conduct that perhaps a dominant firm is pursuing that warrants some scrutiny. That's not to suggest that's not useful to the agency. It's very useful. But it can re reach a point where it's almost engaging in rival raising rivals' costs. So, you know, I have an ultimate point, which I'll bring that back to, but I think that's also part of the genesis of this. It's not necessarily that the metrics by which we care about are changing, such as corporate profits, which Carl has shown maybe that is changing, or concentration, or ultimately consumer pricing and welfare and innovation. It's not that I don't think there's been an, a, a great study and we need to change how competition is pursued because these objectives are not being reached. I think there's something else behind that and that's the, the main concern. If those, the evidence was there that you know competition isn't really serving its objective, I think reasonable minds can say, wow, that's something we really need to, to revisit and maybe we should change that standard. All right, so that's the genesis of that. Um, so, the, you know, um, the next thing I want to do is at the agencies, given that that's what's happening, um, do large firms get a, a pass? Do, um, you know, is the scrutiny different? And I would want to distinguish between two things. One is between scrutiny and standard. I think it's absolutely true that larger firms have more scrutiny, even under today's standard. And, and that could be good. I'm just saying, as an observable fact, that's true. And greater scrutiny is, is useful. So this idea that the agencies, in my experience, at least in the Bureau of Economics at the FTC, are sort of letting the, the big firms go through and allowing them to pursue behavior that, that we wouldn't normally allow, but since they're big, that's absolutely not true. They, they actually have more scrutiny. That being said, the standard, I think, is exactly the same. And that could be, again, this tension that people don't like. This standard, when applied, can suggest that maybe what consumers are, are, are benefiting from large firms merging with another firm, Facebook buying, um, Instagram or WhatsApp or Google purchasing, um, Waze um, and Motorola, these things, that, or, or Amazon purchasing uh, Whole Foods, the perception is that this is, they're just getting larger and larger. What's going on? What's go what is the FTC and the DOJ doing? And I think the problem is, for them, is that we're applying the same standard that we apply to any size firm. And so consequently, there is now a call to change that standard. I think the scrutiny is fine, but changing the standard, as, as Carl and Howard suggest, has a lot of problems, and I completely agree with their ultimate conclusion. Um, so bringing it all home, what's sort of the point I start off with the genesis? 
My concern is if we do change the standard, even in a marginal way, obviously folks want to change it in a more than a marginal way, but even in a little marginal way, if you change the standard, you're obviously changing the rules by which competitors compete in some sense. You might change the ordering of the table just a little bit, make it less concentrated, but you're still going to have winners and you're going to still have losers. And that's going to create an incentive to rent seek. And for me, thinking back, Standard Oil was broken up. Now, it took a long time, but those broken up firms got to be very large, ExxonMobil, Chevron, Marathon. Um, same thing with AT&T, broken up. Now we have Verizon. We still have AT&T. We have other regionals. Now, that interim period in which they were broken up until the reconsolidation perhaps gained a lot of benefits to consumers. I'm not saying that it did, but suppose that was true. But ultimately, in the long run, you're going to still get to consolidation because of economy scales and very natural inclinations to do this. So it's not going to change much is my, my sort of bottom line. You're still going to get this rent seeking. You're still going to have winners and you're still going to have losers. And you're going to get a lot, for me, of wasted legislation um, pursuing different objectives than what I think really maximizes um, total welfare from a market which is consumer and producer welfare. Obviously, we're focused more on consumer. Um, but in the totality, the uh, objectives of antitrust today extracts the most from the market as possible. And I think we should obviously continue to pursue that. So um, those, are, those are my remarks for today. Thank you. Thank you, John. So um, let me just make a couple of quick responses to each of the panelists, and then we can open it up or yeah, have discussion and open it up. <coughs> uh, Carl. I thought your corporate profit slide was interesting, but <clears throat> I would have liked you to have gone back a tad longer because if you go back to 1965, <clears throat> what you see is essentially something that goes like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> in fact, corporate profits uh, in the 60s were higher than they are today, uh, and yet the level of, or at least the, 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 the theory of competition with uh, Harvard structure uh, conduct performance and the famous Brown shoe case, for example, where uh, what was, Brown was going to get 8%, I think, after the merger, something like that. I mean, the Vons supermarket would have gotten to 8% or something. I mean, very, very sort of strict views back then, and yet profit rates in the 60s were higher than they are today. Um, the other point I'd make, a point we make in our book, if you look at the IRS uh, statistics of income for companies and you just look at the corporate sector, um, small companies, small corporations with, uh, I forget the numbers, less than 50 million in revenue or something like that, uh, actually had a higher rate of profit growth over the last 15 years than large corporations did. Um, again, if, if this is really about market power and concentration, you'd expect to see something completely different. You'd see the large corporations gaining, mar gaining uh, profit, higher profit growth. Um, so I think that those are important to look at. The other I think that's important to look at is the recent OECD work on productivity where, uh, you know, they found uh, really around the world, and this isn't a U.S. issue, that if you look at you know, the same industries, controlling in an industry, that what you find is basically the top 10 percent of firms in any industry or some, a lot of the industries have seen robust productivity growth over the last 15 years, and the other 90 percent have seen much slower productivity growth, which is really explains the stagnation or slow productivity growth in the developed world. Um, they also found, uh, there's other studies that found that those high pro pro that higher productivity growth is related to higher profits. So in that case, those companies, if you will, deserve higher profits because they're more productive. And I think the question there is, why aren't other firms doing the same thing? Um, Howard, you also mentioned Walmart, uh, and Carl mentioned Walmart. I just have to throw that in there because uh, one of the points we make in the book, uh, we look at wage levels uh, by firm size in the U.S. and around the world, and uh, I've come to the conclusion it's sort of more of a consensus in economics than supply and demand curves. I mean, virtually every study shows that, on average, large firms pay significantly higher wages than small firms. Uh, and that's true in retail. For example, Walmart wages are 20% more than average retail wages. So in the case of Walmart, they may be getting their benefits from the supplier base, but they're certainly not getting it from their own workers. They're, they're passing some of that high productivity on. 
Howard, you, you mentioned uh, this notion we need to shift other mechanisms. I completely agree with that. Um, to the extent there are other issues, uh, we should have robust debates on that. Uh, well, I, again, uh, the evidence we provide in our book, you can dispute it or not, but a number of scholarly studies have looked at are big firms more, uh, do big firms contribute to inequality, income inequality? The answer is no. Uh, there's a nice study, a nice un unreleased data by BLS that shows that at least at the establishment size, uh, large establishments have the same 90-10 ratio, in other words, the top 10 percent and the bottom 10 percent of workers. That, that ratio is the same as it is in small firms. So, you know, the evidence suggests that they're not the big culprits here, that size is not, not the big culprit here. Um, and then you mentioned stable jobs. Again, the evidence is so clear on that, that large firms, the tenure at large firms is significantly longer, the layoff rates, the Closure rates are significantly lower. If you want an unstable job, you work for a small company. Uh, on average, they're much less stable. So a lot of the thing, I guess this gets the point, a lot of the goals that, that, that the progress, progressives want, which are stable work, high wages, uh, fairness, you know, the evidence does suggest that these are on the, uh, that, that large firms are better at producing that. Uh, and the last point I'll just say to, to John, I thought your point about assigning virtues to small and vice to big, I think that's part of the problem here, um, and that um, that comes with, with, with a lot of risk. So I'll leave it there. I don't know if there's any responses. Can I, can I respond to those last, last points sure. um, just very quickly? My concern isn't with Walmart's wages. It's with its suppliers' wages. My, my concern is not with uh, the wages, and I, I don't mean necessarily to adopt this as my concern. I think the, the concern is not with the wages large companies pay. It's the ability to earn a stable wage and a stable job in that smaller sector that have to work now with and through the larger companies. So when you look at what happens when um, a large company hires, why do you think everybody is falling over their feet to get 50,000 Amazon jobs into their city? Uh, because those are 50,000 good jobs. Uh, and because there is not an obvious engine, I would conjecture, for otherwise attracting or creating those 50,000 good jobs. Whether or not this is true, I think this is a perception that's driving the debate. Um, there, it was a little heartbreaking to read when Walmart opened its store here in Washington, D.C., what the ratio of applicants to jobs was to work at a decent wage, but not a phenomenal wage, at Walmart. I mean, it was 200 to 1 or something, I think. Don't quote me on that, but I mean, it was some shocking level. And what that tells you is, yes, you can look in isolation at the jobs of these big companies and say, not bad jobs, not bad wages, decent benefits. And many of these are terrific companies in terms of how they treat their workers, and they should be applauded as such. And they do great things for consumers. It is the ripple effects back through the economy on everyone who's not working for them. One other point, there is a drawback to having an economy where a large number of the jobs, and you understand like one in eight Americans used to work for AT&T or something, so this isn't necessarily a new thing. But just a point that um, you then have a limited number of companies that are setting uh, labor policy, and setting norms for the workplace. Uh, we're not in a terribly uni uh, unionized uh, period of time. So I do think there are drawbacks even to those jobs and to the nature of work and to the, and to the agency of workers. Again, these are things to be explored and understood as we look at this neo-Brandeisian debate. Whether they're correct or not, I don't know, but I don't think they should be shunted off with um, a partial look at what the evidence is. So just a quick a couple of things, Carl. Uh, I mean, Howard, um, you mentioned that one of the things with having buyer power, if you will, is you, you press your suppliers. And, and, and at least partial, a partial response is increased scale and increased efficiencies. Right. Uh, there's a new BLS study from last year that looked at all the industries in the U.S. and, and compared the ones that had above average productivity right. to the ones with below average. The ones with above average productivity were much more likely to raise their wages. Uh, than the ones with. So there is a, yep. there's some of that that goes on yep. um, that I, I think we have to recognize. Let, let me pick up on a different part of what you said, Rob, <coughs> excuse me, uh, having to do with the OECD work productivity, the, the um, sort of impressive productivity of the top 10% of the firms, which 
is not just the U.S. I, I, I think that's an important study. More generally, one of the empirical regularities that industrial organization economists have found, and John Van Rieden Van has done some great work on this, Nick Bloom, is that within an industry, the productivity, efficiency of different firms typically varies quite dramatically. Okay. So the notion that the least efficient firms are like quickly driven out is not really right. Okay. It's a longer process. It's a messier process. So we have significant differences in efficiency. And very often, the larger firms are the more efficient ones because that's, uh, that's what the evolutionary process it would lead to, right? So, um, so I totally embrace that. I think the evidence is pretty clear on that. And maybe that means big is beautiful. Um, but I just want to clarify what it means for merger policy as an antitrust person. When, I, when we see a merger between two firms who are large, by large I now mean large market shares in a well-defined market, not some overall magnitude, that is a pretty strong signal they are successful and probably efficient. And it's not so easy for other firms to replicate that, okay? Because we often see other smaller firms that have been in the market for a while and they haven't been able to be as efficient. So the implication, and nor is it necessarily easy for somebody in a different market to come in as well and be, okay. So if you embrace this, I think it implies you have to be pretty vigilant and even skeptical of horizontal mergers between two large incumbents because it, entry isn't necessarily so easy. Now. Look, some markets maybe entry is easy. I'm just saying this evidence alone points to a tougher merger control policy, as does the high rates of profit. So that's one of the um, one of my policy conclusions is to to turn the dial up a bit on horizontal merger policy while embracing the very evidence that you've put forward. Can I just ask everybody a question? John, feel free to jump into it. Anyway. There's an interesting, I, I think, sort of factual or you know, empirical question if, if there's because the, the horizontal merger data is, is conflicting. Some says, like the study I mentioned said, it did improve productivity. You look at the, there's a new study uh, that BLS just came out with on airline productivity. I don't know if you've seen it, but airline productivity, massive increase in, in, in total factor productivity. I mean, just unbelievable. And yet, this is an industry everybody decries with too much concentration. So what you have is an industry with more concentration and massive growth of productivity. If there were a merger before DOJ or FTC where you could, you know, look forward in an all-seeing godlike way and say, okay, the result will be a 3% increase in prices, but a 6% increase in productivity, would you, do you think that we should, in other words, how do we balance out productivity and price? Because productivity is a good, it is a societal good by definition, or it is a definition by good. So our prices. How do you do you see that? How do you see that debate playing out? Um, well, if the merger is going to raise prices, we have the hallowed consumer welfare standard that I thought we all agreed on. That sounds bad for consumers. Yeah, I mean, I'd be curious to know what you mean. I mean, if, it, if the wages go up. Well, what, what, here, another. All right, let me put this on the floor. What if we said wages yeah, would go up? You're the one who wants to bring in the wages. Wages be would careful, go up. my friend. No, I love high wages. <laughs> wages go up, prices go up. How do you then justify that, in other words? I mean, that is precisely what I think the antitrust agencies should not be doing. But not looking at productivity, in other words. Well, but it depends what you mean by productivity, right? You know, there are lots of efficiencies that come from mergers, so you can view those as productivities that don't get passed through to consumers. And the antitrust agencies, um, as longstanding policy, don't typically recognize those efficiencies. Now, if what you're talking about is productivity increases in the sense of prices go up, but there are lots more flights and airline routes to choose among. That's a different story because then you quality adjust the price or you, you know, consumer choice adjusts the price. And then what I'd say is that price increase is really not capturing that the product is now different. Now, you've got to think a little bit about it. It's not per flight. It's I now have a choice of a lot more flights. And when I have to, you know, do the impossible and get from Hartford to Kansas City in a reasonable amount of time, I can now actually do that. Um, my, my life is better. I'm paying a little bit more, but I had that choice. So I think there it's a different story. So if it's productivity increase, producer welfare goes up, so social welfare goes up, I think we've decided decades ago we don't care. We 
worry about the price increase, as Carl said. If it's there's some productivity increase that changes the nature of the choice set in the product for consumers in a good way, then you might quality adjust the price and say it's fine. Well, let me let me say first off, there's there's a study I, would, I cited in my paper. Pierce, I think, is one of the authors that, that looks at um, mergers and finds that they seems to have a contrary finding to what you. So I, I don't I don't think we know the answer to that. I think that there's some uh, that is they. they, they, they don't improve productivity of the horizontal mergers, but um, but beyond that, I would say, at the antitrust agencies at least, if you have a merger and you say, look, it's going to increase productivity significantly, then you can argue why, therefore, why it will lower price, because you've got become more efficient, you're going to pass through some of those cost savings to consumers. Then you've got a good argument. But the, the hypothesis you put forward was the price. Okay, just to say so. So it's not as though the agencies are ignoring efficiencies. But they're asking, tell me why those are going to benefit consumers. Otherwise, I'm not so interested. John, did you have any thoughts? No, I, I, you know, you're, that's exactly right. I mean, when I hear productivity goes up, that tells me you're squeezing more output from less inputs. And so that affects cost, and cost goes down. But, the, but what you posited, as, as Carl said, the price is going up predictedly then that, that gets more difficult. I mean, that's ultimately what we care about. But, um, you know, you would expect with productivity – some lowering of costs and some downward pressure on price, but on net, if you see the, the price increase, and obviously. Um, Why don't we open it up for uh, any questions? Uh, you want to jump in? Uh, raise your hand and wait for the mic, and please identify yourself. Hi, Josh Sarnoff from DePaul University. Um, focusing on the issue of the relationship between regulation and antitrust, uh, which I think is the right question. Um, I had three concerns that I hope you'll respond to. The first is particularly for network industries. The scale economies are good, but they have clear innovation effects, particularly by locking out um, sequential innovation because of the barriers to entry into the, and, you know, particularly again for network industries. And what happens is consumers aren't going to switch. And therefore, when other entities make innovations that relate to this, those companies end up getting bought out and integrated rather than being able to compete. Um, we used to do regulated industries regulation for price and quality. We don't do that anymore. So there's a direct connection between the desire to use antitrust and the lack of regulation. Similarly, in the political space, um, size and political influence to get regulatory approvals, marketing licenses, and everything else. Small businesses can't compete, so you have the same concern, including the ability to influence legislation that's going to benefit the incumbents versus others. That seems to be a big issue across a wide range of industries. And the third is by lack of regulation, or even when you have regulation, we used to be giving much greater antitrust immunity. And therefore, um, you know, the idea is, is that we now are looking to regulation to do the stuff that antitrust should have done. So in patent law, you would look to patent misuse doctrine, but it's totally moribund. So I'm wondering if you can talk about how, more about how we get back to doing meaningful regulation that then avoids the need for antitrust or how we then use antitrust in the ways that we used to do price reg quality regulation. Um, all right. Great questions. Um, I'm going to take a swing at them in reverse order. Um, the, uh, the barriers to using antitrust in regulated industries have actually only gone up doctrinally in the last 15 years as a result of the Trinco and Credit Suisse cases. Um, Can you get the mic a little closer? Oh, sorry. And, and if one were to interpret those cases broadly, what it would mean is anywhere that you have sort of a shadow of regulation that affects competition, you would keep the antitrust claims out. That would be a broad reading of those cases, but, you know, it is a concern. Um, so I think the problem isn't so much that regulation can't come in where there's just antitrust. That's a political problem. There's a doctrinal problem going the other way, and that's just something that I think is going to have to be dealt with by the antitrust agencies where there is the re retreat from a competition enforcing rule, going in and pushing the boundaries of those cases and getting clarity doctrinally in the lower courts. Um, in terms of the political influence uh, to get regulatory approvals, uh, you know, lots has been written uh, about that. I can point to lots of uh, big companies that were not very happy with things that happened in the last administration and tried to pull out all the stops to stop those things. Um, one can also probably point to the reverse and can certainly, uh, if one 
credits what's in the newspaper these days, um, as I do, um, credit what's in a lot of good newspapers, um, there is a lot of that going on right now. And, and that is a problem. And even if it is not a question of lobbying to avoid regulation, it's setting the terms of regulation. So a very large tech company that recently had an adverse antitrust decision in Europe is, at least according to the papers, going back and proposing some rules of the road that they would commit to, sort of a self-regulation that, that can then determine regulation for the industry. Is that good or bad? I, I think it's, it's, that, that's an open question, but it couldn't happen if the company were not as big and powerful as it is. And then, of course, there's a general political uh, influence. In terms of lockout of sequential innovation, that to me is largely an empirical question. Um, there is a tremendous amount of innovation that is going on because you have these ready buyers out there in terms of these platforms. And so um, maybe being the parent of a college student who you know works with friends on coming up with these ideas, um, I'm, I'm particularly attuned to this, but they all think it's great that there are all of these huge buyers out there because all you have to do is create something sort of neat and you can do pretty well selling your idea or at least getting hired by these companies because you've shown some talent. So whether that is a motivator or an engine of, of sort of ground level innovation or whether it stymies it is, is really, I think, a hard question. But to get to your core point there, which I think is about your regulation, I would be concerned if there was only one complementary product of each kind that ended up entering the market because that's where you get the problem. You don't have the diversity and the competing innovation. And that's where I think antitrust can play a good role in terms of are you vertically discriminating? Um, you know, the vertical side of antitrust has been in comparative disuse. Uh, we have had no uh, uh, revisions of the guidelines since 1984. There are good reasons it has been in comparative disuse, but maybe a serious uh, study and discussion of how it should be applied to these platforms is not an unreasonable policy debate to be having. Uh, the only thing I want to add is um, just a discussion of network effects, and you bring up a very good point, and how strong a barrier is it. And it will depend on the industry, so I'm not suggesting it's a blanket thing. But that what I, I do push back on is that is it uh, when you see network effects, it's just a barrier. And ultimately, we know very well documented episodes of disruptive entry, you know, Facebook for MySpace and Friendster and Yahoo and Google and, um, and various other examples. And uh, another, th yeah, so that's just something that always concerns me when I hear that ultimate. But I do have some sympathy for this idea, though, that um, you do have this sort of differentiated entry, and often network effects can help entrants gain scale sort of very quickly normally than they would otherwise. When you have something like an Instagram, and I'm not pointing towards Facebook buying Instagram as that being a necessarily a bad thing. I wasn't there. I didn't investigate it. But I can imagine scenarios like that where there is something there because that's the type of entry we say, oh, wow, you, you know, they have network effects, but you have this differentiated entry. But then you purchase that differentiated entry, suggesting they're not in the same market and it's quite complementary. That's where I'm like, okay, maybe we could ratchet it up a little bit because you can't say both arguments that network effects is not there and there, you have differentiated entry. But then when that happens, you let them buy it. So that's just something that's interesting. On this last point, I think there is some feeling, maybe fear, that the wild and fluid internet ecosystem has this congealed a bit, right, with some of these really big, really valuable companies seeming like they're, they're, they're very hard to displace and they control a lot of space. I don't really know whether that's true because I literally look out my window at UC Berkeley, you know, look, over, look out and see San Francisco and, and like it seems like there's so much activity. So I just don't know the answer to that, I, but there's that feeling, okay? Um, and as you point out, getting bought by these companies is, is, is a big draw. Uh, it's true historically, you know, that industries do tend, I mean, the automobile industry, there were a lot of automobile companies and then it narrowed down because of scale economy. So, um, and then it was thought to be an oligopoly that was kind of worrisome until we had more foreign competition. So, so I just think we have to keep our eyes open on this. The, the main area in policy that I think it relates to, and I address this in my paper, is, is um, whether we would have tougher control on the, the, the big incumbents buying companies that they could that could become threats in the future. That would be the potential competition doctrine, which I favor somewhat reinvigorating. But you don't want to go too far. It's a tricky area. I just add quickly, I think there's a 
sort of common view that big companies are the only ones that have power in Washington. And I would encourage you to look at the real estate and realtors <laughs> industry or the contact lens optometry industry. Both of those industries have used the fact that they have thou hundreds of thousands of local you know, people in congressional districts uh, to push for very, very anti-competitive laws that make competition in realty hard, make competition in contact lens hard. And, you know, and this is where DOJ has done great work against realtors and FTC, really great yeoman's work on making consumers have choice on buying contact lenses. So uh, I think we should recognize that sort of anti-competitive behavior is not necessarily related to firm size. It's everybody wants to be able to get their little rent-seeking thing, and small companies sometimes do it. Particularly at the state level, even yes, more so, actually. Really bad yeah, yeah. than the federal level. Uh, I'm going to go here and then over here. And we've got five more minutes. So we've got, maybe let's do both questions at once, and then we'll go ahead. I just have one question. Um, I always find the argument of small business versus big business the wrong argument. It should be about more of these dynamic new companies that are – that are out there versus sort of embedded industries, even the contact industry lens or the real estate industry or the uh, the car dealership industry, which is fought uh, you know against uh, what Tesla is doing and such things. You know, how do we create sort of that dynamic so it isn't so much big is good, big is good, small is good, but growing and dynamic is what we want and creating constant sort of value in the marketplace. And how can we sort of create an environment for that? Is is my question. All right, so why don't we answer that quickly, and then we'll do one more. I'll just give a very quick answer to that. I mean, I think, I think that is the important thing to focus on, not whether a company is big, but whether it has incentives to remain dynamic and innovate. If you look at a lot of these big tech platforms, they actually are competing with each other um, out the back door in, in the sale of advertising. And loss of subscribers and usage is extremely damaging to all of these companies. So when it comes to the incentive to buy up new technologies, part of that is actually about dynamism and adding new features and new functionality and new attractiveness to keep people on their networks. So we want to be careful about labeling things as bad that actually are reflective of exactly the dynamism and good incentives that you just identified. I think tomorrow's companies are not very – that don't exist yet, they're very poor at lobbying. Okay. <laughs> So uh, this is why antitrust, in a sense, and the antitrust enforcement is, in some sense, the proxy or the agent of the consumers and tomorrow's entrance, to, because to make sure the door is open to them, or not, you know, it may not, it may be a hard door to walk through because the existing firms are very efficient. That's tough luck. But if there are other barriers, antitrust can play a big role there. So the disruptive entrant is the hero and we need to make sure they're not stiff-armed. Thanks. David Leduc with the Software and Information Industry Association. Good, good discussion. Um, Howard, I think your response was a good segue to my question here. You mentioned advertising, and um, my question is going to be about, you know, I think Carl and Rob, you both made uh, a number of points about assertions, concerns expressed about some of the large Internet entities without any harm, you know, the notion that, well, gee, you know, are the consumers being harmed? Where, where's the, where, what's the problem here? Um, I, I feel like I've heard the, the discussion and the debate switch, you know, this whole notion of data as a barrier to entry um, seems to be morphing into an argument around advertising, okay? You know, data isn't seen to be a barrier to entry, but some are suggesting that it is an advertising. You know, these, you know, Facebook and Google having the lion's share, 90% of the advertising, is, is, there, is there a data, is, is there a competition problem that leads to that? It seems to me that it's a market problem more than a competition problem, but I'm wondering if you have, any of you have thoughts on that? Well, yeah, it's certainly not 90%, by the way, so again, it's much, much lower than that. But again, it's an empirical question. Uh, one other quick, you gotta remember, when you're putting an ad in, if you're a, Procter & Gamble in the world or Ford, you know, it's, the market really is, do I put it in a magazine, do I put it on a billboard, do I put it on TV, do I put it on radio, do I put it on internet, do I hand out little posters? So you know, it, it, it goes back to what's the relevant market here, and I think that's the first question of any, any in, inquiry. Let me pick up on the point about big data. Um, I was just at a conference on uh, economics of artificial intelligence, and uh, one of the themes there was that you know, the data is the critical input to do machine learning, basically. And so there, um, there are going to be big advantages to incumbents who have a lot of data, okay? I think that's um, – it's a form of scale economy again. Um, the 
I think we're going to see some regulations that will force data sharing. Okay, but that's really not an antitrust job. That be you know maybe we're going to have a data sharing on autonomous vehicles for safety reasons, for example, or other health and safety. And that seems to me it could be a very good thing. Um, and there'll be some voluntary sharing of data as well. So, um, so I think that's an area we're going to see a lot of attention to. Uh, because it's such a valuable asset and it's going to become more valuable because it's complementary to this exciting new technology of machine learning. To get to your question about whether there's a competition problem or a barrier to entry, there are a lot of people doing good work on this. I'd refer you to the work of Catherine Tucker at MIT and some other folks who have been thinking hard about, uh, about data. Um, I I'm not convinced that there's uh, a barrier to entry problem. And I think it's really important when we think about data to be aware of just two things that may seem very intuitive within an antitrust framework, but that should be thought about really hard. One is the notion of data as a barrier to entry. It's an empirical question, um, largely, and I think people need to investigate it more. But I don't. the evidence so far doesn't make it look like that's actually as grave a problem. The other is when people talk about data sharing and antitrust treating data as some kind of essential facility, uh, I worry for two reasons. One is I worry generally about essential facilities as an antitrust claim. Uh, but more importantly, dividing data between actually informa and, and information, which is the data processed, which can be something where a, firm, a company really adds value, is something one needs to be very careful of. You know, it's one thing to say consumers should have control over their data and share it. It's another thing saying that any of the processing also has to be shared because that kind of gets back to Alcoa-like skill, foresight, and industry that we want to reward and incentivize. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm very skeptical of the big data arguments as of now based on the studies I've seen. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add is I completely agree with Howard's uh, conclusion on big data uh, as a barrier to entry because I think largely just a, a quick observation is data is not valuable in of itself. It's an input into a larger production process. And so the question is, is what is that data allowing you to do? Is it lower cost? Is it to differentiate your product and various things? And there's different ways to achieve those objectives other than just with data or in complementary with the data. And so those are the larger issues in viewing data, not as sort of this asset in of itself that uh, you obtain market share because of it. So um, for those of you who are interested more in that, there's a report that Joe Kennedy wrote for us about a year ago on data and uh, competition policy, and we came to very similar conclusions to that. Uh, so I want to thank uh, really three great speakers here. I really appreciate all of you taking your valuable time to join us. I thought it was a great conversation. And uh, thank you all for joining us this morning.